It's time to talk Gonzaga basketball. Get ready. It's the Spoke Review Zags Insiders Podcast. Here we go. Here's Jim Meehan and Richard Fox. Good Monday morning. Welcome back to the Zags Basketball Insiders Podcast. Jim Meehan, Richard Fox with you for another fun-filled half hour or so. Uh, Zags feeling, Zag Nation feeling pretty good about now. It's a 2-0 start. Uh, your basic 38-point win over the number eight team in the country, Baylor. Follow that up with a uh, kind of hard-fought 88-80 win over Arizona State. Pick 12th in the Big 12. So uh, Zags are, are moving up. They're number four in the latest AP poll, number five in the USA Today poll. That's two spots gained uh, just from this 2-0 start. Uh, Foxy, I think there's already some buzz about the Zags nationally. That uh, tends to happen when you beat a top 10 team by 38 in the first game. Yeah, pretty standard, just blow out top 10 team, huh? Um, Happens I, all I just, the time. Yeah, yeah, it's par for the course. Uh, I mean, it's pretty evident that Jim, I think, two games in, that this team, ha- the, their ceiling is is awfully high. So not, not surprised at all to kind of hear what the narrative is, is starting starting to become for this squad, for sure. Yeah, uh, pretty impressive. This is now off the top of my head. Four straight over the Big 12. Two of those were were pretty much routes. The Kansas in the tournament last year, I think that was a sweet 16, 89 to 68 uh, was that final. The Zags moved on. They beat TCU in the tournament uh, as well. I think that was two years back, 84, 81. Uh, I, I see now why the big 12 was uh, in active <laughs> negotiations. I think everybody does. Uh, I think Brett, your mark, uh, not to, you know, go on and on about it, but Brett Yormark is really focused on college basketball as well as college football. He thinks both can be very uh, uh, lucrative outlets in the media rights industry. And and uh, I think he sees the Zags as, as something that could help that. Now, he's, he ran into some uh, uh, opposition within the conference, and a lot of that's there's so much newness to the conference with BYU and Cincy and that group joining and then the four Pac-12s. But would not be surprised if that was revisited someday down the road. And and you can see why. The Zags have a good record against the Big 12. They've got a pretty good record against uh, almost all the major conferences. And uh, when you do what they did to open it up, let's get right into that. Baylor, uh, when you look at Baylor, and I think you went to the game, you mm-hmm. watch them. They have an airport team. They will catch your eye when they walk through the uh, concourse of an airport. <laughs> Athletic, old, physical, mature. Uh, you know, maybe not a ton of experience together because they brought in some key transfers and, and they've got a couple of really nice freshmen in Edgecombe and Wright. Um, but I think what you saw ultimately there was the Zags on top of their game, both ends, offense and defense. And you saw Baylor still fitting the pieces together. Um, you know, the talent's there. Everything you see with the naked eye is there. It's just going to take a few minutes to get those guys all on the same page. And the Zags just took off and never looked back. Yeah, I, look, I, I think I've said this before. Uh, to you, Jim, you're going to have three or four games a year where you play um, kind of outside yourself and, and maybe put it all together in a way that it's not reasonable to expect every every night. And then you're going to have three or four games a year where you just don't play well, can't buy a bucket, just really struggle, whatever the case might be. And the good teams, um, you know, win those three or four where they really struggle. Um, but when you, you have those three or four games where you play outside yourself, you really see what the top end could look like. And, you know, I think what was jarring about it was just as the first game of the year. Yeah. So, um, I, I don't think the performance was necessarily surprising, but just to see that on opening night was, was what caught my attention, but you saw offensively how dominant this group could be. I mean, shot at a really good clip from both the three point line, um, and from the field, I mean, almost 70% inside the arc, the, you know, the bigs just dominated Baylor. Baylor, that's really probably their biggest weakness, uh, that and, and some questions about their ability to knock down the three-point shot consistently. But Gonzaga's bigs, 47 points, 
shot over 62 percent from the field i mean just no answer for the uh, for gonzaga's size and skill quite frankly on the front line for baylor uh and baylor just really struggled to score i thought the defensive capability this group had we talked about it last week particularly after watching that usc exhibition is are they going to be able to keep dynamic teams in front um and that's still certainly going to be probably an area where they're, they're, they're always tinkering and trying to get better. Uh, but boy, they made Baylor just couldn't get going from the three point line. And even on drives, um, if they got a step on Gonzaga, Gonzaga's length became evident, you know, and, and I thought Dusty was really impressive coming off the bench and everyone's talking about his shots, the shots he made, but it, it was, to me, it was what he did defensively, his ability to keep guys in front, his length, uh, you know, Michael really impressed me with his size and ability to guard multiple spots. So, I mean, just a tremendous performance on both ends. Uh, clearly the better team on that night, and, and I suspect probably a better team overall throughout the course of the year just with the skill. The balance Gonzaga has, Jim, is not just in the rotation, not just in, their, in, in where these guys play, but their ability to be elite on both ends. Um it's just really impressive. And, and that balance on both ends is something they haven't had a lot of. They've certainly, there, there are teams, I think, if you and I really thought about it, that were elite on mm-hmm. both ends of the floor. Um, but that doesn't come around very often. I think this group has a chance to be elite on both ends. No, 2017 was probably the most balanced. Yeah, I would Their agree. Their defense was top shelf that year with the rim protection, the four bigs, great guard play, Nigel. I weren't maybe explosive offensively, but they were just mind numbing, numbingly <laughs> efficient. I mean, yeah. it was pass, 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 in the shemic, kick out, whatever you needed. Nigel on the drive. Uh, but this team, if they can guard that way in that game, uh, and they went one and one in that regard, they did not guard that well against Arizona State uh, this week. But if they can just approach that level defensively, uh, they are going to be. Uh, somebody's going to have to deal with them in March to to knock them off. Because when you're that good on both sides of the ball, it's like a football team when they can, right. you know, all phases. And uh, very impressive. Uh, I thought Baylor made a, a run in the second half. I think they got within 13. And that was about when Khalif Battle just went boom, boom, boom. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Change. And you saw that again against Baylor. He, uh, he 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 came up big in the second half. Didn't do much in the first, but it it is that offensive balance. I mean, when you're getting what they get, twenty nine out of the two posts in that game, mm-hmm. probably more than that against uh, uh, Arizona State. I think thirty three in that game out of Huff and Ek, and the guard line doing their thing. You know, Nemhard was just out of his mind. This this whole. Uh, weekend and our first two games I should say uh, so just uh, across the board I would have never dreamed it would have been a 38 point outcome well, I wouldn't I wouldn't yeah. have bought 18 well to me what, what what stood out was just how comfortable they were I mean yeah. I, I I think I made the comment I, I expected it, it might be an ugly game just with nerves and I mean, it looked like it looked like they'd been playing. You know, they were already in league play, and they were playing Baylor in February, like they played Kentucky a couple years ago in the arena. Um, and that, you know that that speaks to the continuity, continuity that they have. How many guys they brought back, and the two main pieces they brought in when, in battle in uh, Ajayi are plug and play yeah. guys who've got you know particularly battle a ton of experience, and, and Michael a little less so, obviously, but you know a full year. Um, at, at Pepperdine with the ball in his hands a lot. And um, both of those guys, and we can talk more about them uh, towards the end of the pod here. What I, what's impressed me is they have both clearly bought into what, to the program and what the idea is and what the role is going to be there. You know, there are going to be moments where there just isn't space for them to, to be ball dominant, to, to get a chance to score, but they're not forcing anything. They're not turning it over. Um, they're both leaning in defensively. You know, that was a, a question I had, you know, last week was, you know, that's not necessarily something battle did consistently at Arkansas, really more of a score. I think he's held up really well on that end. And then Michael, you know, it, it certainly has the tools, but at Pepperdine, it just wasn't part of that program's DNA to get in the stance and guard and, and, and make multiple efforts. It was very much an offensive centric system. Um, he has been, I mean, if, if we were, you know, 
all league defensive player, put it that way. I mean, he, he might, you know, he's looking like he might be player of the year when it comes to defense in, in the league. That that's and what a benefit for this staff after losing Watson is to have a guy who's similar, not the same, but similar and, and a better athlete than Anton was, to be fair. Yeah. So it, the, just a really excellent roster construction. We knew that going into it, but I think it's been evident here in the first week with both those guys. Yeah. Uh, Michael's, uh, you know, imprint was all over that game against Arizona State. Well, both games, but he he has that rebounding uh, that want to that Domus had back in the day. Every ball he went after. And I tweeted this out yesterday. I think he's going to, he's going to give Ben Gregg a run for the floor burn leader this year. He's on the floor all the time, whether it's defensively or scrapping for loose balls. And uh, he is uh, he, ideal fit for what they needed. And, and that rebounding, I think you cannot overlook that because, you know, last year's team was good on the glass. Uh, but when you have a guy who can pull a 11 or 12 down like that, not playing in the 30 minute range either, then you got Khalif Battle getting seven uh, out of the guard position. Uh, you know, that that changes the equation. That gets well, your yeah. game going. That gets your yeah. second chance going. But uh, if, if you'd asked me at the start of the week, I would have said Arizona State was the team that might have lost by 38 to the Zags, not Baylor. Well, I expected I, – I, I did not expect the game we saw yesterday on Sunday uh, after what I I, 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 fought, I watched the highlights they had against Duke in an exhibition. But, um, you know – a quick point on on Michael. If you're wondering what a great rebounder looks like, that's what it looks like. A guy who will go get the ball outside of his area. In other words, you know, Graham EK is a good example of a, a high, high level rebounder in his area. So he's got his position. If it comes anywhere near him, he's you're not getting it from him. Michael will go, will track it. You know, if he's on the left side of the basket and the shot goes up and it's going right, he will move, you know, go get the ball. Um, Gonzaga's had a lot of those guys in the, in years past, but it's been a minute. Uh, yeah. He really has a nose for it, and he, he, he just his motor seems he's playing with a, a motor that I didn't see at Pepperdine. In other words, another way of saying that is an effort and a consistency to that effort. And th that may be unfair given you know the level Pepperdine was at, but his motor is at such a high level, and it, it, it the luxury that they have now with the four bigs is. You know, the message ought to be, you need to run yourself to the ground. Yeah. We're going to take you out. You're going to get a rest. And there's yeah. no, they, they, there is zero drop off with any four of those kids. Yeah. It's remarkable. I mean, yeah. they are all starter level, high yeah. major, high major, meaning, you know, power four conference level starters on Gonzaga's front line. So when you have that kind of equity and talent and ability, there's no excuse. You you need to play as hard as you can, and all four of them are doing that. But I think with Michael, it really stands out because of his his ability to rebound outside of his area. Yeah, go go play six minutes, seven minutes, as hard as you yep. can. And uh, you know, I mean, between Ben Gregg and and Michael as as your fours, <laughs> you cannot have two harder playing dudes. In the well, and that. they both and they both play so much on the perimeter when they're when the shot goes up they're they're flying in for the three-point line and i can tell you that's the worst because you know i was always happy to play center because the guy i was guarding was relatively close but when you have i mean they fly in there so it, you have it's almost like the equivalent would be stepping in on a guy who's driving and taking a charge a big guy yeah you have to have some toughness just to i to a locate them and then B, throw your body in front of them when they're just sprinting to the front of the rim. And most teams, you know, you you to do that over the course of 40 minutes is really difficult. You might see stretches, but both of them, I think that's a really good point, Jim, is because of where they play on the floor, they're really hard to box out. And yeah. they create so many extra possessions for this for for the program. Um, and you know, as they get further in the year and play better and better teams those extra possessions are like gold. You, yeah. you you want as many of those as you can get. Yeah, the hustle plays that those two, you can already see Michael has the, you know, if he can't get the ball, the tip out, the Anton Watson probably patented that play. <laughs> and Greg does that all yeah. the time too. He just somehow, you know, knifes in there and, and tips the ball away and then makes a diving save or whatever. And uh, those energy plays, uh, those two uh, have provided a ton of them. 
Uh, I, I was impressed with Arizona State now. That, uh, yeah. again, two good bigs. The, the young kid, the freshman acquaintance, I think it is. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the player that really hurt the Zags yesterday was Jah- Jah- Jahid, I think it is. Bashir Jahid had 22. I think he had five combined in the first two games. Pretty good guard line. Again, another high five-star kind of guard in, in, uh, on the outside to go with some experienced guys. And, and, uh, and I think – I'm not sure Arizona State can play much better offensively. Now, defensively, there were breakdowns, and they had trouble with the Zags, but that went both ways. The Zags had a lot of trouble, again, with the ISO and the dribble penetration. Dribble penetration by the bigs. I mean, the two big kids for Arizona State would get it out by the three line and, you know, like Drew Timmy used to do, navigate their way inside. But uh, I think that that team has some ability. Uh, I will be just like USC in the Big Ten. You, you look at their players, their personnel, and you give them time uh, to bring that together. I, I, I don't see the 12th place finish for, for Arizona State in the Big 12. I don't see USC at 14 in the big 10. So two great or three great tests, really, when you count the exhibition for the Zags, they're not going to run into too many more teams that are, are as athletic and size guard lines, all those things, you, you toughness, you know, physicality, pretty good preparation for what's to come as well. So let's move ahead. We'll go a uh, quick look at, uh, at uh, this week's game. You uh, mass Lowell comes in Friday. Uh, that's probably not going to uh, get get a double take from the season ticket holders at, at Gonzaga. Uh, you know, extra points if you can name their nickname, uh, the the River Hawks, I believe they are. Uh, but this team has won twenty plus games the last couple of years, uh, playing the America East, and they've pretty much been on the uh, doorstep of March Madness. Three out of the last four years, they've played for the America East tournament title game. They've lost to Vermont the last couple games uh, in the title games the last couple years, I should say. And then I think they lost to Hartford in the 2021 title game. So this is a team that's kind of uh, itching to kick that door down and get into March Madness. Been right there. They've stuck with their coach for a long time through some lean years and uh, finished 142 in the net last year. Um, you know, for you know, reference, that's in the below the San Francisco Santa Clara's uh, of the WCC. I think Santa Clara was in the hundred range last year, but then you dropped LMU, which was in the lower one eighties or nineties or something. So in between that area, in terms of the net ranking with what you might uh, see from a, a WCC team, I, I don't think this is going to be quite the breather, uh, that, uh, maybe it looks like on paper. Uh, but again, it's a lower level conference. I think they played n- no quad one games last year and only four or five in the quad two. So a lot of their games are quad three, quad four, but it's a team that knows what they're doing. They added some transfers. They got a lot of kids back and they got some high hopes and they're kind of coming in here thinking, you know, this, this is the kind of game we could get some attention for ourselves and maybe uh, come March. We don't come up one short if, if we do some uh, some work in uh, the McCarthy this weekend. What do you think? It, yeah, I mean, it's two games in a year. They've played nine in the rotation. You know, that, that you, you might see that shorten up a little bit against Gonzaga, depending on how the game's going. They're really small. I mean, biggest player is 6'8". Um, you know, but they, what, what they'll do is, they'll, and they're older. They've got, it's an old, mature group. To your point, they've been knocking on the door. I don't think this is a group that's going to come in overwhelmed by the kennel. Um, just because of their experience on the floor, both uh, individually and, co- and collectively, you know they, they've got uh, five guys in double digits, led by uh, Quinn Mincy, uh, good size, six six, average about twenty four game to start the year, shoots it at a good clip. It's going to be a good test, I think, for Gonzaga because it's the the, the counter. You know, I still think the strength of this team this year for Gonzaga is their their, their inside players and the uniqueness of just how talented they are and, and how versatile they are, particularly scoring the ball. Um, the, this is the inverse now. You, UMass Lowell is going to be very perimeter-centric. They're going to put a lot of pressure on Gonzaga's perimeter defense to keep guys in front, um, You know, try to create some situations where you've got a big having a guard, uh, a, a perimeter player that's got the ability to put the ball on the floor, 
So I just I, I agree with you. You know, this is a game that Zaga should win, and, and they, it, we expect will win. Yeah. But I think it's going to be an interesting fight. You know, if that makes sense, because styles make fights. Yes. And I think if uh, UMass Lowell can stay comfortable in the kennel, make a few shots early, and put some real dribble, you know, dribble penetration pressure on Gonzaga, Gonzaga is going to have to really get in a stance guard and maybe make some adjustments on on how they want to. Certainly, a different type of test than what they've had the first couple of games of the year. Yeah, and this is a mental test for them. They're they're going to no, yep, they're, yep. they're going to hear, well, we're favored by twenty four or whatever it's going to be. And yeah. it's a breeze, and we have all this time to prepare. And then we've got San Diego State coming the next game. That's going to be a test of their minds and their attention to detail and bringing energy onto the floor. And and uh, we'll see how they do with all that. But uh, and, and we were going to talk about San Diego State, but then I realized that was next Monday. So we will hit that Monday morning before that game. And as I look at the schedule, that is going to be – that is going to end up being – one of their toughest tests of the season. You're talking about playing in Viejas Arena, which if you've been there, I, you, I think you guys, did you play down there when you were? Uh, no, no, never got there. Well, it is it is a, a difficult, uh, huge arena. I think it's, they hold NCAA uh, first and second round games there. I think it seats 18 or 19, and they fill it up. Uh, especially for big games and it is loud and active and giant bulls around the court. And uh, it's one of the better home court environments you're going to come across. And they have kind of the team makes it. Uh, uh, it's like Gonzaga. It's not necessarily the McCarthy. It's the team that keeps coming out every year in there. It's, it's the same thing down there. Great success under Brian Dutcher, but uh, we'll get to those guys next Monday. But I'm I'm thinking that's going to slot about number three on their difficulty list behind UConn and New York City. And I would have thought Baylor uh, at, at the first game of the year. But, you know, they might run into Arizona in the Bahamas, mm-hmm. Indiana. I mean, they're going to have UCLA, Kentucky. They've, they've got some games coming, but that one will be one to watch. So let's move on to some topics. GU-related yeah. topics. Uh, we've got Ryan Nemhard, 22 assists, two turnovers. Um, you know, he's he he has the same ability his brother had at, at Gonzaga of just manipulating the ball screen actions. And he had about two or three times, I think with Huff, on at least two of them, and then maybe one with EK, where he he was – he waited. He had this – like half second breath wait and then fired the pass and and it made the whole play work uh he doesn't rush it he knows how to manipulate it he knows when to go fast and slow when to bounce it when to fire it over the defender's back of his shoulder uh he he kind of has that ability to control a game he might score what did he score against baylor five six something like that (laughs) and totally controlled the game uh from the from the point guard position not turning it over. You know, you look back a year ago, the shot wasn't falling. He wasn't he wasn't quite in in uh, sync with his guys. His just numbers were down. I mean, he's he's made a pretty good leap and he did it against good folks in these first two games. So what do you make of his start so far? Uh it is just a, the luxury. I mean, he's Gonzaga's most important player. Uh, you it just I, I don't see a situation where, where the game's going to get away from Gonzaga with him on the floor. He just has the ability to control the, the pace. He doesn't turn it over. You know, two turnovers. He has two steals. So, you know, net on the year, he's at a zero. Yeah. Um, you can never speed him up. And as a result, you just can't speed up Gonzaga. So, Gonzaga, you know, every time down the floor, they can get into their stuff. And he makes life so easy for everybody else, particularly these bigs. I mean, it feels like half these guys' shots are just catch, turn, and shoot. Mm-hmm. Or I'm in stride and I'm I'm at the rim already. Um, you know, if I if I sat down with Gonzaga's bigs, I'd say, "Look, you're probably never going to have it this good again. Yeah. So just enjoy yourself." I mean, honestly, that, that having a point guard like this is so rare. Where he he, he takes so much of the burden, you know, handling pressure. Uh, making sure guys, you know, the ball gets to where it needs to go. He guards, 
um, he's just out there controlling everything that it makes it so much easier for everybody else. I mean, he's the definite, you know, if you're, if you're wondering what it looks like to watch a guy who makes other players better, that would be Ryan Nembhard, right? Yeah. And his brother was certainly very similar uh, to him. And, um, you know, he's had a good start to the year shooting the ball three of five. I know it's a small sample, but I like the fact he's not shooting a ton of them. Yeah, I feel like last year he had to shoot some of those shots just because of the lack of scoring options Gonzaga had on the perimeter. He doesn't have to do that this year, so he can take them when he's comfortable. That one he hit late against Arizona State from beyond yeah, the, from the NBA line was was just a, a huge shot. Um, it's just he's it, he's poised to have uh, an All American, quite frankly, kind of season. Uh, with you know, it, 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 and there's nothing, there's no reason not to think he's going to continue taking care of the ball, delivering these level, the, these amount of assists with the talent around him. Right. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. you know, if these guys, if this group ends up top four, a uh, top four seed in, in the in the uh, in the tournament, and he's putting up the numbers, I think you and I are talking about. I mean, I think we're having a conversation about him being, if not the best, certainly one of you know the top two or three point guards in the country. Yeah, and he's a guy that you know he. He can score. I mean, at times last year, you really saw it, that he can score if he wants to. Andrew can score if he wanted to. But they know the value of um, getting Dusty involved and getting uh, Battle involved and, you know, working the pick and roll. And I, I think they know, uh, you know, the importance they have to the whole offense. Not, I'm going to get mine and you guys find your own. He's just the opposite. He's I'm getting you guys your own. And if I really, really have to, I'm going to, uh, cause he can shoot the, he's got a great mid range game. He can get out on the break, you know, as, as good as anybody they've had uh, very to, to keep the turnovers down with the amount of time he, the ball is in his hands. Uh, I mean, two turnovers and well, uh, yeah, it's not even. It's not just the turnovers though. Like he doesn't take bad shots. I mean, yeah. occasionally every player does. But I mean, how many times have you and I seen bad shot, long rebound? It's a fast break for the other team. It's a you know, a lot of coaches just consider that a turnover. Yeah, you know, you're just you're punting it to the rim, taking you know, kind of a you know, me first shot or a, you know, just a poor quality shot leads to a long rebound, and now you're you're playing on your heels. You give up two points on the other end. He doesn't do that. No. So it's not just the lack of turnovers; is he just doesn't make mistakes. And then when he does, you're looking. I mean, you're looking at it like, what? Like you just. <laughs> It's so jarring, right? And, and I don't know. I just I, I can't say enough about um, how good he is. Uh, he does it all while being undersized, but he doesn't play small at all. Um, and you just you're not going to get away. You get, you're not going to be able to get away from Gonzaga this year, I don't think at all, because of him. He yeah. just he can his his fingerprints are are everywhere. Well, I I just keep thinking, I don't know what the counter is. You know, last year. I could see maybe sagging off him, trying to guard the ball screen a little different and say, hey, you got to prove it out there because we know what you're going to do if you get to the elbow with the pick and roll game. So, yeah, but, he's, what, but, but he, doesn't he's freak, he, he doesn't freak out about that. No, no, and, he hits and, enough and, shots. Yeah. Where he's probably not going to bug him, but I yeah. don't know what the counter is. That, that's something you maybe try, but I ain't guaranteeing it's going to work. No way. Uh, let's move on to the defense. Uh, we've, We've had the, the broad spectrum with the Zags this year. We had the good, Baylor, the very good, Baylor. We had the bad, Arizona State, for, for large segments of that game. And we had the ugly, USC, which I think they were pushing 60 in the second half. Um, and kind of the same, it kind of came down to the same things. How they guarded man-to-man, -man, on ball, uh, dribble penetration. Um, against Baylor, it was exceptional. And rim rim protection challenges by Ben Gregg, I can remember. E.K. Huff had a nice challenge without fouling, helping off their guys. Uh, in the gaps, slowing those drives uh, and recovering against Baylor. Those were all as good as you can do it. Wasn't quite the same against Arizona State. I think some of that issue was that the bigs took them out 18, 20 feet. Arizona State's bigs and, and went to work from there. Uh, lost a little track of the three-point ball again like they did with USC. Uh, there was so much collapse that the kickouts were working, I felt, at times. Uh, so, again, that's the defense is going to be probably the, the the telling factor as we go along here to see what 
like Gonzaga does in the long run. But you can see what they can do, but you can see, you know, teams have had success against them. Uh, that, that's going to be the thing with going forward. What what does the defense look like in a 40 minute stretch, especially when they play these better teams? Uh, mm -hmm. That's what they're everybody's going to see the tape, you know, just like they watch the Zags offense. They see the Zags defense. Uh, where, where do you think the Zags go from here defensively? Is it is it just a matter of finding that perfect on ball gap without getting yeah. I mean, I, I, I thought Arizona State hit some tough shots. It, you know, certainly, they were able to spread Gonzaga out in a lot, if not not a very dissimilar way that Gonzaga could do that, particularly when they have uh, Michael and Braden out there, just because they can space the floor. Um, I, to me, it, it felt more schematic than it did in, in discipline than it did the ability. And I, I just don't have any questions after uh, after a week. Uh, looking at you know being able to see their personnel in in a live environment that they've got the pieces to be yeah. elite on that end of the floor. I mean the one thing they don't have, um, and we talked about it last week, or maybe I said this, you know when you're talking about a Final Four level team, you start getting nitpicky. You start thinking, well, they don't have this piece. The only piece they don't have is they don't have a guy at the rim. Yeah. So because of that, keeping guys in front of the perimeter is, you know, it's always important, but it's even more so when you don't have anybody at the rim that really deters high level guards when they're, you know, when they get a step on their defender. But I, I think a lot of it, it, to your point, is just, you know, getting those, the, the, getting guys in the right spots, you know, on the weak side and gaps on drives, that kind of thing. They can coach that up. You know, I think those are things that they can correct and they will correct. Um, you know, some, you know, the other guys on scholarship too. And I, I thought Arizona state hit some tough shots. Um, you know, there was what in the first half, a guy banked in a three with two seconds on the clock. I mean, when you see that sometimes that's, I think as a player, you're like, okay, we, we, we just got to get this. We got to do our best. We got to guard these guys. And there were a few of those in the second half too. I thought were some really tough shots. So I, I don't want to take, I don't, I wouldn't take too much from that. Yeah. Um, look, if you and I are chatting in April on this podcast, that implies that they're in the final four. Yeah. I'm willing, willing to wager that we are talking about them being in the final four because how they guarded in the sweet 16 and in the lead eight. Yeah. At the end of the day, that end of the floor is going to be the difference maker for them. And nothing I've seen here to start the year leads me to believe that that's going to be an area that they're going to struggle. I think they'll figure it out. No, and to your point, they they they, they say the right things. I mean, Khalif, uh, Khalif Battle, he, he says, I don't even think about offense. I, I know if I guard and do those things that that part of it's fine. Ben Gregg said the same thing that, you know, we know what we have offensively. It's defensively, we can make probably the biggest jump. And so they know that. And, and, uh, and obviously Mark few is not going to let things slide. <laughs> None of the coaching staff is. And, and that's why those kind of high level games that they play, they play three very athletic, physical experienced teams. And, and it, it you can, talk to your blue in the face, but when you can show them, look at this play, look at this, you know, health right. defense. And, and that's where you get better. It, it, you don't get better blown out of a, a, a lower, lower level team by 50 necessarily. It's, it's when the, the game is on and, and they've had three of them like that already. So uh, let's, let's wrap it up. We'll talk about the rotation, uh, you know, the depths. That was a, one of the preseason topics, uh, uh, kind of that uh, Zag fans were, were bantering about a little bit. Uh, they do have depth. They have great numbers. But you can see already that the, the rotation is, is kind of uh, in this eight-man rotation that they've got going right now. They can go deeper, obviously. Uh, but they haven't really had to. I mean, those eight have been borderline uh, extraordinary at this point with the start. I mean, you've had Stromer with terrific minutes in the opener. He had pretty good minutes in the first half yesterday. Uh, you know, off the bench, Huff. I mean, Huff is doing the Timmy score per minute routine as good as you can do it. He is – he just fills it up. What, 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 what would he average if he played 32 minutes a game? Oh, goodness. I, I mean – I mean, I, I think he looks to me like a guy – he looks to me like a Wiltshire type. I mean, yeah, if people remember if you, Kyle. If you, yeah, you do Kyle the 40-minute thing. 
he's, he's probably oh. around 30 points a game. I mean, I think if he played 30, 32 minutes a game, yeah. he'd be well over 20, maybe yeah. uh, getting to 25. And he just, you know, Gonzaga's had these guys in the past, right, that just are just pure buckets. I mean, they just get you points. And it's yeah. remarkable. But yeah, I'm sorry to keep going. I just, well, yeah, I, I was, was just going to kind of round him up. Ajayi uh, has just been, you know, if you, you could not, if you went to the, the pad of paper and said, we need this and this and this, Philippe Bell, his, his driving ability, his free throws, his three point ball is pure when he's open. Um, you know, and rebounding that, those seven boards the other day was big for them. Yeah. Um, you know, Michael is, hard work in both ends rebounding is huge hit a big three in the first half yesterday uh you know guards multiple positions you could not write out better job description for those guys they brought in then with the depth you have i mean you you literally i think you're going to have this rotation where probably six or seven of those guys are going to have games of 20 (laughs) 25 maybe uh, battle is going to drop 35 on somebody. He's going to get going and the floorboard is going to, and the pedal is going to be to the floorboard all game. Uh, but uh, I think that's an easier number for Fuey to work with uh, eight people. It's one at almost every spot. You got the two bigs, yep. up and EK, you've got the two fours, EK or um, uh, Ajayi and Benny Gregg. Uh, then you bring Dusty in. He can play the two or the three with battle. Um, I think you might see in the long run battle swinging in to, to be kind of a backup point guard if they want to get Nolan or Ryan some, some breathers. Uh, it's, it's an easier number to work with than that nine or 10 that you look at the roster and go, you got 10, 11 guys. And it's, and the, the fit, we keep talking about this. It fits really well right now. And uh, I, I think that eight mo- man rotation is is, is kind of here to stay unless something happens injury front or somebody really rises up in that nine to eleven range. Yeah, that's hard to that's hard to to think's going to happen at this point of the year. I mean, it's you know, I'm hard pressed to think of uh, I'm thinking of Mar- Marquise Carter back in the day. I mean, that's that's a name for the past. You yeah. know, that wasn't playing much. Injuries came up, and all of a sudden he kind of. Without him, I'm not sure the tournament streak continues. But, um, I mean, look, 78 points off the bench in two games, that's okay. just unheard of um, at any level, let alone college. So yeah. um, I've been really impressed with Battle, just his patience. You know, one of the things I was curious to see was, uh, I mean, he only took nine shots a game last year, but he would, he'd have games where he would he'd throw them up. I mean, but he has, to, I mean, outside of one drive I can remember against Baylor, he's not forced anything. I mean, maybe I'm missing a possession, but he just, he plays within within what they're trying to do. He's getting a lot more open looks than he was at Arkansas just because of the balance around him. And to your point, his he's rebounding at a high level. He's got good size. He's obviously clearly an exceptional athlete. That that dunk he got off of the alley from Nemhard against Arizona State was uh, Exhibit A of that. Um, I, I just I really like his pace and how he's playing. He's not forcing things, um, and just look, they've got seven high major starters, and I think Dusty's knocking on the door of that. You know, I think with Dusty, part of it is. Um, improving with the ball, not turning it over. He had four turnovers against Baylor, improved against Arizona State. I think just valuing the ball a bit more. But, you know, he's – I mean, he might be their best perimeter defender, um, you know, in total just because of his length and and all that. But, you know, I think the offensive side of things, he's probably a notch below the other seven. But, I mean, it's just it, – it's to have seven guys you probably could – just pluck into uh, in almost every other roster in the country and they would start is just remarkable to me. And to your point earlier, it's just the balance, man. They, they just, it, the roster construction for this group this year is feels, and, and maybe it's just the moment, but feels about as good as this staff has gotten in a long, long time. Um, they, they are too deep at every position, their quality uh, at all these spots, everybody can score, Everybody can guard, you know. I mean, I, I I was super impressed with Huff and Stromer. I mean, Baylor and Baylor saw those two on the floor, and, and, and they watched tape, and they knew last year that was like an open door policy for Gonzaga defensively. When those two are on the floor, 
put them in pick and roll. We're going to get something good. They, the way they held up, and, and I think you, I'm not surprised Dusty's made a jump defensively, but I have to be honest, I'm surprised how well Braden has held up on the defensive end. Yeah. Is it he, in pick and roll action? He's, it's not a problem. He's got a much better feel for how to hedge, how long to stay to get back. His motor's higher. Um, so yeah, it, I mean, we could go on and on, man. It's, this yeah. is a this is a good group. I mean, they they have they don't have a lot of holes. That's pretty mm-hmm. evident. And it's like we talked about. I mean, you can go play six or seven hard minutes and come out and and actually go back in and do it again. You know, instead of fourteenth minute of the first half, and you know, well, and, 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 and yeah, and, and and they have, I mean, they have so they have set rotations and ideas and all that. They've clearly done an exceptional job of getting everybody to understand this is the pre- this is the program, this is the plan. Uh, something to watch, though, is that you're going to have to keep whatever that dialogue is in house. They have to keep that going at a high level. I mean, you look at I mean, EK's 13 minutes against Arizona State. It wasn't as if he played poorly. No. You know, four of six rebounded fine, but they they just said, "Look, we're going to roll with Ajayi and and Huff down the stretch." Same for Ben. Right. So those guys are mature enough where you don't anticipate a problem, but you have to have an open communication, open dialogue with your players. And I think everybody understands right now what we're trying to do. We are we're going to use our depth. And there may be nights where, you know, Graham is just cooking and Braden doesn't get to play. Right. But what you can't there do is will you, be nights when Graham you get, is cooking. Yeah. You He's cooked a lot in right. two years. <laughs> but 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 as a staff, you can't take that for granted. Yeah. You have to keep everybody tethered together and make sure that they all buy in because it may not just, it may be on Friday, UMass Low has nobody inside and Braden goes for 14 points in five minutes. Yeah. And you're like, okay, well, you know, we're going to, and it's tight game for by example only. And you're like, well, we're going to keep going with Braden. So it, it's not as if it's just a game to game thing. So I'll be really interested to make sure that they do, they do the job well enough where, they don't have any one of those eight or any two of those eight start feeling as if they're not part of that group that, you know, they're not, they, they have to keep all of these guys engaged. I think. Oh, it's, I mean, practices. And I've asked the guys about it. It, it has got to be about as high level as you're going to see in practice. Cause they, they're nine, 10 and 11 are good players. Yeah. You're I mean, right. I'm talking about Emmanuel and uh, June. I mean, uh, those practices, uh, you weren't, you were in time. If you get on that court, you're in time after practices and, and what you do uh, in games. So, hey, that's going to do it for the Zags Basketball Insiders podcast. Foxy, enjoyed it as always. You can find us on everywhere. The Spokesman Interview website, all all the places you find your podcast, Spreaker, Spotify, Apple, you know the drill. And I'll post it probably here in about an hour or so. We'll be back with you next Monday. Preview that San Diego State game. That's a big one. Uh, But for now, 2-0 starts. Zags are up to number four in the AP poll. Come back and join us in a week.